jump in. Welcome to the Environmental Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Grady. Today's guest is Richard Crawford. Richard uh, produces video programs and writes articles and publications from focusing on luxury travel and unique experiences, whether he's profiling the uh, exclusive private islands of the Maldives but, or staying in elaborate tree houses in Swedish forests or skiing the glaciers of Chile. Crawford is, uh, been uh, brings his unique presentation and style to every project, and he's also really focusing on how you can really, you know, his passion about ecotourism and sustainability and social responsibility in his, in his uh, travels. And, and he highlights this in his show, uh, Leave No Trace. So, Richard, welcome to the show. Hey, Sean, how are you? If you don't mind, I'm going to have you walk into every room before I do and just read that out for me. Like, <laughs> trying to make like the biggest entrance ever. <laughs> like, here's Richard. He's here. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great, man. That's good. Um, well, hey, I saw your show uh, when you, uh, you, you posted up on, um, I think it was Amazon prime is where oh, it's Amazon at. You can prime. find it on Amazon prime. And I watched the, uh, the Peru Machu Picchu, uh, episode you did, which was really a, a really great, cool episode and well done. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to, you know, I thought, wow, you're doing ecotourism. It's a big topic. A lot of travelers are going to exotic destinations to, you know, do more of the ecotourism things you do. Like I didn't want to see the cool natural habitats of, of nature instead of just going to, you know, New York city or something like that. Right. right. So, uh, and they want to do it in a sustainable and socially responsible way. So talk a little bit about yourself, how you started this uh, and, and, you know, maybe a little bit of background about your brand ambassador for a couple different uh, brands you've been involved with and we'll get it going from there. Yeah, sure. So my my journey into ambassadorship, which which ultimately is being a storyteller for for any brand, um, was started in the Scotch whiskey industry. Actually, I, I grew up in Scotland. Um, okay, probably tell from that. Nah, good no, I can't even tell, right? <laughs> uh, I've been here for a long time, so you know it's a little it's a little bit diluted. Um, but my first, you're, move, you're moving to bourbon now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like a lot of bourbons, actually. There's, there's some good Kentucky bourbons that I really like. Um, but my my first kind of soiree into ambassadorship was with, with Glenn Livett, Scotch whiskey, one of the, the largest Scotch whiskeys in the world. Um, and basically with them, I was, as an ambassador, um, I was telling a story. I was telling a story to the sales force or, you know, their sales that were the uh, sales team that was located throughout the country so that they could go on and, and sell the product. Mm -hmm. I was telling the story to the, the owners of bars and restaurants and liquor stores so that if anybody approached them in the store, they had some kind of background information. And ultimately I was doing a lot of consumer facing events where I was in a room with a bunch of consumers who were there to taste Scotch whiskey and learn about the, the history um, and how it's made and you know all about the maturation and ultimately increase their enjoyment uh, and increase their experience, expand their experience of the whiskey that they were drinking. So that's kind of where I started my ambassadorial role. Um, and I absolutely loved that. I, for many, many years, I, I traveled the world doing it. Yeah, um, that's how, that's how, let me just interject real quick because I got to, I got to touch on this real quick. You yeah. know, tasting a specific whiskey or, you know, understanding the flavor tones and how to understand and taste a, a particular whiskey in a proper way. Once you understand how to do it, yeah, it really opens up your whole, you know, palate and understanding of the various flavors of different whiskeys. And I was amazed. So I, I'm pretty interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times it's just, it's a matter of adding just a little bit of water. And a lot of people don't realize that because the myth is, ah, you know, you drink whiskey like a man, whatever, yeah. whatever, you know, and, and you don't add water, but it actually opens it up a lot and releases out a lot of flavor profile. And the other, the other thing is it's not supposed to be snooty or snobby. Uh, ultimately, if you don't taste some of the things that the person's telling you to taste, but you're along the same guidelines, like it's fruity, could be anything from apple to pineapple to banana. Right. As long as you're, as long as you're in the realm and you're recognizing some of that, then you're not doing anything wrong. So yeah. All right, carry yeah. on. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so I found that when I was doing these consumer facing tastings, that the questions at the end of the night kind of expanded beyond the whiskey itself. They were asking about, 
because my life was really interesting. I was very, very fortunate. I was traveling a lot. I was getting to work closely with other brands, other luxury brands, because there was a lot of partnership between whiskey and other brands. Mm -hmm. So people would ask me at the end of the night, instead of just asking about the whiskey, they'd say, you know, where'd you get that watch that you're wearing? Or I love your shoes, man. Where'd you get them? Hey, where'd you get your suit? Where are you traveling to next? So all of those questions were coming up. And I realized that there was probably a market for that from, from me as an individual to work with several brands on a lifestyle kind of uh, level, mm -hmm. uh, promote several band, brands, not just the Scotch whiskey. Mm -hmm. So I ultimately left Glen Liver. I started my own business, Richard Crawford Luxury. And um, yeah, I started to tell, I managed to very fortunately again, uh, partner with several high-end brands that, that that saw the opportunity with me talking to a bunch of people in a room and it kind of worked out so I was I was covering a full blown lifestyle instead of just the whiskey itself and then uh, that kind of turned into me visiting a couple of luxury hotels and telling their story which ultimately to, to cut a very long story short got me into travel and then television world Oh, that's awesome. So, you know, you've kind of, you've taken some, some, you know, passions, so to speak of things you personally liked into yeah. creating a business out of it, which, you know, if you can make a, a business out of things you really like it, good job, right? Right, right. <laughs> I, I'm very, I'm very, very fortunate, Sean, things worked out. Well, that's cool. So, you know, is there a sustainable way to visit the wonders of the world, you know, in exotic places and extraordinary, you know, luxury, you know, is, is it possible to actually do this in a sustainable way? You, you, that's kind of really the leave no trace premise of this show you're doing. So maybe let's talk, let's dive into that a bit for the listeners and maybe give your perspective on that. Okay. So the answer is absolutely yes. Um, uh, and, it, you know, we focus on the luxury aspect of ecotourism because we felt like the message before was, you know, if you want to be in sustainable travel or ecotourism, you have to go live in a mud hut barefoot and eat berries, right? <laughs> and, and that's, and it's just not the case. Like there's a lot of incredible, extraordinary, luxurious destinations and resorts that are doing an incredible job uh, providing a sustainable and and eco experience and when you're looking for it i mean there are, there are several things to look for when you're going to do it um is is the accommodation you're going to visit eco-friendly and later on we'll get into what that means right yeah um are they for example are they using uh reusable materials in some instances the places we visited or or you know local definitely local materials right are they recycling seems very very simple simple right but not everybody's doing it. Um, and do they have some initiatives where they're trying to reduce the carbon footprint um, and offset their emissions by doing like farm to table? Most of the places we've went to, they have their own garden. So they've reduced the carbon miles of their produce because they literally have the, their own garden on, on the premise and they grow their stuff there and, and that's what they're using in their kitchen. And then lastly, there's a few places we've gone. In fact, there's several places we've gone that are using solar power for their energy or wind power. So all of those little factors together, um, even in luxury eco-sustainability, because very often when people think of luxury, they think inherently it's more, has a higher carbon footprint than regular travel, but it doesn't. So no. if you're finding somewhere that does all that, then you're an eco-sustainable luxury traveler. Now, how do you account for your travel to get there? You know, I mean. All right, so that, that's a question. That is a question that always comes up. And yeah. look, the, the world that we live in, it, we can't all get in, a, get in a rowboat and row across the Atlantic or the Pacific, you know. Yeah, it, or ride it, your bike or hike. Yeah, I mean, you, right. you know, yeah. right. So, so to get to the destination, especially if it's an international travel, you have to fly for the yeah. most part. Um, the way that we offset that on the show is we always tick the box on the flights. Do you want to offset your carbon footprint? Okay. The, answer, the answer for us is always yes. Um, it costs a few dollars more, but it reduces that part of the carbon footprint in getting there. Um, also, there's a lot going on right now, um, and I found this out with one of the latest places we visited in Antarctica, 
there is some uh, sustainable aviation fuel that is being yep. developed. Yep. So as we get further into that, um, things will be even have, have an even less carbon footprint when it comes to traveling. Also, if you want to offset it, there's always other programs you can donate to or be a part of that that is n nothing to do with travel, but offsets your carbon footprint. For there you go. Travel. Right. So there, there's ways to reduce the carbon footprint. Exactly. You know, it, yeah, exactly. to, to make it, you know, I guess. A, you know, a legitimate good decision to go, to, you know, far places. And um, so, you know, how does uh, sustainability, climate change and environmental, social and governance, you know, ESG factor into your passion and promoting the locations on your show? Like, you know, I, I watched the one and I thought it was really great that you dove into like, well, how does this uh, location really invest in ESG or sustainable practices and, and you showcase that. And I think that was great. So how do you decide where you're going to go? So we do a lot of research before we go and we're looking for three or four things. We're looking for the sustainable aspect of it. Uh, we're looking for also a huge part of sustainable and equal travel and carbon footprint has to do with social responsibility, social and cultural responsibility. A lot of people forget that sometimes, but you have right. to remember that aspect of it too. Overall guest experience is a big part of it. Are they still able to deliver with all of the all of the stipulations in place? Can can they still deliver an overall incredible guest experience? And we do our research and we find these places. And, and to be honest, when we first started the show, that is not what the show was about. It was about just doing incredibly luxurious things. Uh, it was actually called Out of the Ordinary, the show. Okay, okay. And we found that when we were at these places filming, that they would start to talk about the programs that they had in place that had to do with ecotourism. Yeah. And a light bulb went off. We're like, that's a story we need to tell. Yeah, you were like, uh-oh, I'm onto something. I think yeah, this, so, oh, this is really cool. <laughs> exactly. So there's a couple of episodes where we actually had to go back to the place where we originally filmed. Oh. We filmed it from a completely different Perspective. Completely perspective and the Maldives is one of those places, so we didn't really, you know, we weren't really too upset by that. Yeah. <laughs> Darn, I gotta go back, yeah, yeah. But we, wow. we're, we're so impressed, like the, the, the passion has increased over and over for every place that we go because we get really impressed with what these people are doing, yeah. No, absolutely, yeah. you could, you could see, I mean, uh, some of the programs that uh, you highlighted in the uh, the, the Peru Machu Picchu episode that was super really good i mean yeah that, that first episode is really good because it covers a lot of different things we actually moved to a couple of different destinations within the episode which is quite unusual too um but it really looks at sustainable sustainability and ecotourism and social responsibility from several different aspects so it was, it's a good episode to kind of get your feet wet yeah no i, I totally agree I, I recommend it we'll see if we can get a link uh on the on that episode uh you know when we post this up um oh, okay. So, so many people are now looking for uh, sustainable ways to travel these days, but what's been your experience of how companies are marketing and promoting these types of destinations? I mean, I'm, I'm sensing, you know, there's more interest in like, come see us because we're, you know, eco tourism friendly, you know, type thing. Yeah. What do you think? It's, it's kind of going hand in hand. More people are saying, I want to go be an eco tourist. And more companies are saying, come see us. We're, you know, we're employing various strategies to, 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 to have equal tourism. So there's, there's a few things that they're doing. So they're actually showcasing their conservation efforts within their, within their marketing materials, like making a, a large statement saying, hey, we're actually doing this. Also in the past, if you go back 10, 15 years uh, and a destination or an experience is saying, hey, we're eco sensitive and we're doing a lot for sustainability. A lot of times it put people off. They're like, oh, you know, I don't want to be preaching. That means that. I'm not going to have a good experience. Exactly. Thing, right? <laughs> exactly. It's like, oh, you know, I'm not, that's not, it's not me. You know, you know, I'm not a tree hugger. I don't yeah. want to be barefoot in a mud hut eating berries. Right. right? So, right. so they, they're showcasing their conversation, the conservation efforts within the social media. Um, a lot of companies are collaborating, especially when it comes to the the um, social impact of it and cultural responsibility, and working with local local people by doing anything from you know getting their groceries locally or, or getting the materials locally or hiring local, um, and you know it, with all of that going on, that also helps promote the fact that they're they're eco tourists. Are you still here? Did I lose you? about 
Did I, did I lose you? <laughs> you lost me there for a second. It All was right. my fault. I was uh, scrolling on something and it, on the it screen. Went and it no, no, like, what happened? I, I lost you, but did they lose me? Because I'll just keep going from where You're I fine. I, you know, it'll, it'll keep going because that's All what right. happened. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, and, and companies even now are, you know, partnering with bloggers and influencers is just a part of life now. And right. even 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 destinations that are eco-sensitive and sustainable see the value in that. So they're partnering with influencers and, and eco-travel bloggers who have the same kind of similar ethos. So, and then a lot of the companies are doing these, participating in conferences, workshops, sustainability initiatives uh, around the world when they go to these travel and tourism expos yeah and highlighting what they do this is a lot of different things that they're doing well i i can you know a couple years ago my oldest daughter she went to porto vea porto viajo in porto costa, rica, yeah, yeah, yeah. In costa rica yeah, yeah and it was like it was dubbed as you know an ecotourism location and she took a big uh, yoga class there and, and spent uh, about a month and a half there. We went down there to see her graduate and spent about a you know a couple of days down there. But I was really impressed by, you know, everything there. I mean, it was really like, hey, go live in the jungle here and the holler monkeys are up there. You know? yeah. <laughs> and, and you were just really kind of experiencing uh, a, a real ecotourism, uh, ex you know, environment. And it was yeah. pretty impressive. And. Uh, it was the first time I'd heard of that type of concept where people were really wanting to go in and search out those type of locations. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so it's pretty cool. Um, well, I see a lot of your destinations you're promoting as luxury travel locations. So yeah. can you share with the audience what that means? Uh, I mean, it's quite simple. It's basically once in a lifetime experiences for the most part. It's very aspirational travel. And it's somewhere where there's, you know, attention to detail for the individual guest experience. So it's it's always hard to define luxury. Um, but obviously the places that we go um, a little more expensive than, than the average than the average vacation. So it is a very, very aspirational. But again, I, I reiterate the fact that these places are so luxurious is not taking anything away from how much they're doing from a from a sustainable, and sustainable uh, aspect well that's great i mean uh what are what would be some of the the most luxurious eco-friendly tour places you've been uh so that's interesting so the, the, the maldives the maldives in season one um was was the most uh an organization called Seneva. Um, probably one of the, the highest level luxury experiences we have, but also that organization, Cineva, really set the bar for us as far as what they were doing from a sustainable point of view. There was one one of the villas we stayed in. It was like a, a villa, but it was eleven different little buildings around the uh, big buildings around the pool. Yeah, and I think the going rate for that was you know forty or fifty grand a night. <laughs> but but, it, but taking taking that taking into account, it's one of those places where you would do a corporate retreat, maybe for your top, uh, and, and it housed probably thirty people. Oh, okay, so one I, yeah. So it's where you would take thirty people uh, for a couple of nights, top salespeople and all that kind of stuff, or a wedding party, or, or a wedding party, or something like that. But it was it was, I mean. Again, if your audience, your listeners, you were, were, you were blown away, I can tell. <laughs> I, I was blown away by it. So the Maldives, in fact, it was so good. We turned the Maldives into two episodes, episode nine and 10, because we okay. did so much there. So wow. if your audience is listening, we'll, we'll get a link in for those episodes too. Oh, that's great. Great. Yeah. Any other any other great little destinations that were kind of like, you know, sleepers you didn't expect to be so amazing? Well, I... People often ask me, what, what's your favorite location that you've done? And up until January this year, uh, the answer was very difficult. It was I, everything, you know, offers something different. Today, it is it is by far Antarctica. So Antarctica. We, we, we did Antarctica for season two. Um, and I, I still, when I think about being there, I mean, you can see my face. I just get excited. Like the, the uniqueness of the experience and the vulnerability of being there, it's a very vulnerable place. Just oh. add it to that whole experience. So it is by hands down my favorite place. 
Okay. Well, all right. So those are like the most luxurious. Let's let's pivot a bit and what would be the most affordable eco-friendly travel destinations for those on a budget that, you yeah. know, you'd say, hey, uh, Sean, I recommend these places. Yeah. You, interestingly, you just mentioned one of them, Costa Rica. Uh, and we did an episode in Costa Rica for season two. We went to a, a coffee plantation that is also a luxury villa and, you know, luxurious experience while you're there. But it was very, very affordable. Mm -hmm. um, Finca Rosa Blanca was, was the name of the place. Um, and Costa Rica as a country are the, the most sustainable and equal sense of country in the world. They, they've been doing it. Like you said, your daughter went there years ago. They, yeah. they were ahead of the game. They were pioneers in it. Yeah. Um, and it, it is very, very affordable to go down there. Belize also. So Central America, I think, from, from a cost point of view, uh, is obviously a developing part of the world still. Um, so from a cost point of view, that's usually pretty uh, a, a lot of value for your money. We went to Panama while yeah. we were there as well. Yeah. And we went and swam with the bioluminescent uh, yeah. algae at yeah. night. Yeah. Oh wow, that was amazing! Yeah. And we stayed on this island over here, uh, over there. Oh my gosh, what was it called? Uh, unfortunately, I can't remember. But it wasn't too far from Puerto Viejo. Uh, but it was, it was, uh, it was a really great trip. And uh, I like Panama too because the currency there is the American dollar. I didn't yeah, realize. Right. I was it's like, easy. wow, that was interesting. Oh, man. No math, yeah. Sean. That's, yeah. that's cool when you can travel and not have to do the math. <laughs> I was like, hey, this is great. I like Panama. This is cool. <laughs> so that was a neat little place too. Uh, I thought uh, from an ecotourism perspective, but um, well, what trends are you seeing now with regard to ecotourism? I mean, are you seeing like a big increase or it's kind of just peaking into the market and people are starting to understand what it's about or well, where do you think this is right now? No, it is, it is full blown. People are looking for it and, and the okay. trends are definitely there. Um, yes. There's a growing demand for authentic and immersive nature experiences people don't want to just go to a hotel and sit on the beach all day but at least uh, the trend is that whereas in the past part of a vacation was going sitting on the beach for two weeks and, and drinking margaritas that that's changing people want that immersive experience they want to be able to integrate or, or they want to be able to mingle with the local communities and support you know that aspect of it so that's a trend that we're seeing um, people are definitely looking for sustainable accommodations. So not just the destination, but I touched on it earlier. Are the places that they're staying sustainable? Are they doing things that have conservation practices? Um, are they using renewable energies, water conservation, sustainable food sourcing? So people are actively looking for that. Yeah. So that's a trend now that wasn't there before. Um, we touched on transportation. Um, you know, obviously I talked about flights and stuff like that. It's almost unavoidable. But once your boots on the ground on where you're going, people are looking at more eco-friendly transportation. Um, and, and some of that sometimes is going into the countryside on a bike right. or looking to do a little more kayaking or white water rafting, just things that require less um, engine power. Um, I mean, technology is now playing a role in ecotourism and sustainability uh we we visited uh we did norway as a as an episode in season two mm -hmm. and one of the things that this organization provided was a porsche ev wow. so um normally if it had been a regular car we wouldn't have used it it just wouldn't have fit for the concept of the show but right. it was an ev and we we got to drive around the fjord You're like so, yes yes a porsche <laughs> Not only was it an EV, but it was a Porsche. So, you know, that, that all, that made it, that made it. I uh, love it. I uh, love fun. it. Now, okay. So we're talking about going all over the world, but I gotta, I gotta, let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about our own national parks. I mean, yeah. we've got some amazing national parks yeah. out West specifically yeah. that I would argue are quote unquote ecotourism locations as well. Wouldn't you? One one million percent. You know, you know, the national parks was founded by a Scotsman, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Muir. <laughs> he yeah. Anyway, that's me just promoting Scotland at this point. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, we did dabble with the idea of season three being only the U.S. where we're going to 
um, partner with an EV company. Yeah. We travel across the United States, visiting 10 locations across the US for a whole season that was all US based because there is that much here. Oh, I was blown yeah. away in, in season one. We did a New Mexico episode. Okay. My concept of New Mexico before I went there was that it was desert, you know, not a lot going on. And in fact, we visited one of the Ted Turner uh, ranches reservations. Oh, okay. Mayo, yeah. For yeah. Mayo. And I was blown away by it uh, and all of the programs they had in place and the beauty of it. Yeah. And, and the, the, the struggles that, that were in place, but they were, they were doing a good job with ecotourism and, and getting one of the ranches was full of those, you know, those oil derricks it was an oil company that owned the land before. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were reclaiming the land back and doing a lot of cool stuff. So you're 1 million percent, right? America has so much to offer when it comes to ecotourism. Yeah. I mean, out West, uh, you know, go to Yosemite, go to Muir Woods, go to, you know, the Kings Canyon, go to, you know, Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, Glacier. I mean, there's so many great parks that, you know, yeah. I think would qualify. And, you know, you can take a train. You can yeah. take an Amtrak all yeah. the way to Glacier. Right. Very sustainable. Yeah. All the way to Glacier, right, and get right off at the, the lodge there on the east side of the park, and you're good to go. Yeah. That'd be, that'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah no, for sure. I, I also find, I, I got asked, I was doing another podcast, and there was this rapid-fire questions at the end. Yeah. Uh, and one of the questions was, um, you know, on, on vacation, is it city or country? And I, like countryside, or countryside. My my um, outlook on vacations has changed, and what I do on my vacation, as it, uh, from a young man to an older man, yeah, um, more now. Give me outdoors. Let me walk. Let me breathe in the fresh air. So, yeah, there's a lot to offer. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, part of the show that you do, you do a bit of a, a rating, you do a sustainability ecotourism score yeah. for, you know, what was the uh, the programs that were involved at the, the destination, and all, you know, all the in, you know, sustainability aspects of it. Talk a little bit about how you grade your, uh, you know, your visits yeah. and what goes into that assessment and, and talk a little bit about how that is when you evaluate the impact uh, for Going to yeah, so I believe there's four. I think we graded on on four on the scorecard is eco, sustainable, um, social uh, responsibility, and overall guest experience. And to be honest with you, Sean, it's nothing too technical at all. We don't take a lot of numbers and crunch them, and we, we give it a grading, um, a letter grading from A, B, or C. Um, and it, it's just our personal experience and what we experienced in those four aspects of, of what I just outlined. Yeah. Um, and the grading, we, we did all of the seasons, we completed all the seasons, and then we graded them individually. So that was almost a, a bar was set based on the overall, um, the collective, and then yeah. gave them their grades based on that. So it's a nine times out of, nobody's getting any less than, than a B plus usually. Yeah. Um, so it's a very, very, it's very simple. Uh, and it's a lot of it is based on our own experience and not a lot of number crunching or logistics. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious. Yeah, we, how... say that. We, we say that we're like, look, this is no, we haven't created some magical mathematics. Algorithm that, you know, breaks down yeah, the yeah. CO2 emission impacts yeah, no. for your travel. <laughs> it's not, it's not what we're, it's not what the show is about. Yeah. Well, I, I say this a lot. I am, I am learning about ecotourism. I'm not a complete eco tourist expert and I don't imagine there are a lot of people that are but I always say it's all, you always want a lot of people doing a little something than very few people doing it all so I, yeah. I feel that I'm the boots on the ground for the average guy who's watch average person who's watching the show like I, I'm you I know at home I there's a lot that I could do to be a lot more sustainable and, it, and it's tough it's not easy yeah, you just kind of constantly think about it, yeah. and, and we we kind of say, "Hey, just try to think about it, making every decision a green decision, right?" Yeah, you know, like, there is one little hint that I'll give get the listeners that I've done. Somebody pointed it out to me, and it's really, really good. How much crap mail do you get? Like, how much mail wow. do you get? Well, you're throwing it away every day. Well, uns you can unsubscribe to that, so that that paper is not getting delivered to your house. You can so try. <laughs> yeah, right. You can try, but it, it's something quite simple. And I, it drastically yeah. reduced what we get. So Sure. Absolutely. No, Everybody absolutely. Everybody doing a little bit, you know. 
Okay, well, you know, hey, what are the main challenges we face as a society uh, when it comes to choosing an ecotourism or an eco-friendly location? What would you say the challenges are we face? Like, uh, is it just like finding out where it's located? As, or Yeah, yeah. As consumers, I think it's maybe just finding the place and then finding enough about the place when you find it for you to be comfortable in going there. Yeah. Um, now it's getting better and better, you know, social media and obviously the internet, the internet and all the tools you have at your disposal there. So I think the hardest part is just, you have to dig in. You just have to dig in and do the research. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, that the episode I watched that you guys did it in Machu Picchu, I mean, that was like, that was a lot. It was a, you were driving a lot of miles up some yeah. curvy old hit mountains <laughs> in yeah. that little car. And yeah. I was like, you need a four wheel drive for that drive. <laughs> no, there, was, there was a road. We took a wrong turn. People will see the episode and we were basically off the edge of a cliff in a little car that wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> <laughs> but it made for good viewing, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did. I mean, I think there's language barrier concerns too for people, right? It's like, hey, I've, I've got cultural challenges just communicating with people. Yeah. That could that, be a that's, that's something that's come up and people have asked us about also. But even now, you have the technology for that. I mean, you can put it in your phone and your phone yeah. can do it for you. Also, before that even has to come up, I found a lot of places we've gone are very quite remote and in places where the language is not even similar. Um, and I found that there's a lot of communication, um, nonverbal communication. Yeah. It goes a long way. Um, yeah. And because people often say, well, don't you go to these places? And what if the people don't like you? And, you know, what if there's a conflict? And I like 99 times out of 100, the people we're meeting are just good, down to earth yeah. family people, the same as you would meet in America. Yeah. And yes, there's a communication barrier sometimes. We've often got a translator. Um, but if we don't, it's just, a, it's just a body language thing, you know? Yeah. Right. 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 No, I, I agree. I agree. Um, are there environmental concerns with some of the locations that you were showcasing on the show that, you know, kind of surprised you? Yeah, so Machu Picchu. Um, we, I, I couldn't believe it when we went up there that these ruins that have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years, people could actually just sit on them and eat their lunch or be on their phone. Like they weren't roped off. Mm -hmm. and, and there had there was obviously an impact on that. And, and the worst story that I heard about Machu Picchu is that it used to have a monolith right in the middle of it. Oh, really? Up until the 1980s, um, very, very tall, one, one stone monolith. And uh, it's very difficult to get there to, to Machu Picchu. It's not easy. And the king of Spain wanted to visit, and he wanted to go up there in a helicopter, so they cut down the monolith. So the helicopter could land in Machu Picchu. Oh, God. That's, that's the most horrifying thing that I've heard. That is horrible. So wow. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's absolutely nuts to think about. That is horrible. Uh, that is. He's been there for hundreds of years so he could land his helicopter. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Well, okay. So what are some of the keys to creating a culture of sustainability in the tourism industry, you think? Uh, the keys to creating a, a culture of sustainability in the tourism industry and just in general, not, not, it doesn't have to be an eco tourism, but you know, just sustainability in general. Right. Yeah. I think it's just, just the places you're going, having best practices, then encouraging people to do the same. Um, the, the fine line with luxury tourism is that it's high paying customers. And a lot of times they don't like to be told what to do. And they certainly don't like to be spoon fed all the, 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 the sustainability programs that are going on. But most of the places we visited do a really good job in getting people involved. And it is not mandatory at all. Right. So I think that's where I think that's where the fine line is. Don't make it mandatory. Just highlight that you're doing it nine times out of ten, no matter how rich or obnoxious the people are who are going there, they kind of want to get involved. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so during your show, were there any like scares that like, holy crap, this was a little bit more than I expected? Like for instance, I saw that you, you know, scaled that mountain to go stay in a bubble on that one show. I was like, that could be pretty uh, nerve wracking. Anything else like that that viewers might want to there, know? There's about. a few occasions in the show where there is there is height issue. If people were scared of heights, I I wouldn't recommend it. Um, I'm trying to think of one in particular that, that that was really scary. Nothing nothing comes to mind. I'm pretty gung ho when it comes to trying stuff. 
Um, so there's nothing that I can think that, that absolutely scared me. Um, I was on the back of a horse and we were in New Mexico and we were filming a piece with a drone. And I, you know, I said to the, the guy who was taking us out on the horse, I was like, will, will the horse be bothered by the drone? He's like, no, they're fine. They're very, very placid animals. They don't care. And it sure as hell that, that my drone operator brings a drone down to take a shot and the horse starts to bolt, and, you know, jump up. And I, I get on the back of a horse as in, you know, I go to a, a pumpkin patch and they put you on the back of a horse and you ride it. You know, I'm not a horseman. So as many horses as I've been on in the show, I'm still not a professional horseman. So that sure. was that was quite here on scale, uh, to be honest. Well, I got to imagine just uh, it was a little probably nerve wracking to go to Antarctica, too. I mean, like you could freeze to death down there. Yeah. So Antarctica, I, I mentioned earlier the vulnerability of it. Antarctica is the driest, coldest um, and the windiest place in the world. It is twice the size of Australia. People don't realize the massiveness of it. And at any given time, at the, at, at the peak of of the season, which is summer, where the sun stays in the sky. I think there's only like a total of 6,000 people on that whole continent. Mm. There's no running water because it's all frozen. So there's no water, you know, source. There's nothing grows there. So if you got, you know, there's nothing to eat, there's nothing to forage. Right. Uh, and there's very, very little shelter. So you truly, truly are at the mercy of that place. And it, it's a very short step from being on there and being on the surface of the moon. Outside the fact that there's oxygen in Antarctica that you can breathe. Yeah. It, it is the vulnerability is very little difference from being on Mars or the moon. So there's actually um, accommodations in Antarctica for luxury travel. Cool. It's called, uh, look it up. It's called White Desert. Um, okay. They, they are... Suniva, I mentioned earlier, with a pinnacle for us. White Desert uh, now equal that for for us. White Desert season two, and um, Patrick, the guy who runs the company, actually transversed Antarctica on skis and a and a one of those wind parachute things with a bunch uh -huh. of stuff behind them. He was one of only five people to go across the whole continent on skis, and he felt like you know, like he he's incredible. Like I, I've got a a crush on that man, just from how adventurous he is yeah and uh yeah he felt that when he did it he's like people have to see this now it, that's again a very very high-end luxurious experience it costs about 100 grand a person and the pods that you're in are very uh space age futuristic they're, they're like yeah. literally like little pods you would see on the moon or, or mars yeah um, but they've done an amazing job of, of giving people that experience down there well, wow, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, you know, what's uh, what's on deck for you next? I mean, you, you've kind of you've got two seasons in the uh, in the bank, so to speak. Right. So yeah. how many episodes is that about 10 or 20? Yeah, so the first season was 10. Second season was eight. But okay. it looks like at this point it's going to be nine because as we're editing Antarctica, we're realizing that there's so much that we don't want to leave on the, the cutting room floor okay. that we, we have to we have to just make it two episodes. There you so go. it's pro probably going to be nine episodes. Um, the next few months is us in the editing room, just putting it all together. We we end up with hundreds of hours of footage, and we have yeah. to we have to we have to basically condense that to 47 minutes. Uh, or a commercial hour when it, when it comes to TV. Right. And it's very, very difficult. And it's, it's a heartbreaking process. It really yeah, is. Yeah, you're like, oh, I got to keep this. This was awesome. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, it, it is a heartbreaking process. Or I really did a good job on this. I'm going to keep it. Like, sorry, buddy. We're, we're, st we're still developing our website and stuff. And it needs to be renewed. And it's going to be renewed soon. And when we do, there, there will be so many extras all the stuff okay so some outtakes a little couple act outtakes all, i mean so hours and hours and hours of it okay. so that that's good people will get to see some of it that's awesome that's awesome well i mean richard i i, I think a lot of people uh, envy your uh your your job right now i think this would that'd be a really fun uh, job to have um where can people find the show now that yep. 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 So so currently today they can get on to Plex, which is P-L-E-X, which is a, a streaming platform. Um, it's free to sign up if, if you don't mind commercials. So if you want to watch the show with a few commercials, it's free. Um, it was on Amazon Prime for a while. We took it off to distribute in other countries, but it goes back on to Amazon Prime in a few weeks. So it's still on there. If you went there today, it would say, hey, uh, it's on here, but you can't currently view it. 
in a few weeks that'll change and i say hey watch this episode i actually watched it on amazon yesterday just all right so cool you know. so then, it, then, it was there so then, i think then, you can get it on amazon prime it's back up least- again. if you if you any of your listeners happen to live in asia at all or, or pan asia um it's on that geo um so we were very excited that Nat geo purchased it in that region of the world um and then um it's on in, in the united states it's also on EarthX tv which is i believe on satellite or direct tv one of the higher channels it's just called EarthX tv okay. so you can watch the episodes on there too so there's plenty of places to go find it oh that's great that's awesome yeah. that's awesome well look I think uh, you've shined a light on, you know, ecotourism and and being uh, involved with, you know, more sustainable luxury travel. I think it's really great. I, I like the show. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot out of it and find out that, boy, I want to go check that place out yeah. and have that experience. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe uh, a couple of the episodes, you might get some affordable ones that we... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, us, see, us regular us regulars can go check out. <laughs> <laughs> but that's pretty great, though, buddy. Hey, I really appreciate you coming on the show today, uh, Richard. Love what you're doing, and uh, thanks for all you're doing. Uh, Sean, I really appreciate the opportunity. I had the chance to watch some of your previous episodes, and I was quite impressed. So it, it's, it's an honor to be on here. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, and uh, look forward to catching up soon. Sounds good, mate.